Hello and welcome to Lard TV and the fourth programme in this series where we walk through Infamy Infamy and the rules and mechanisms therein. Today we're looking at close combat, uh, clearly a key area in ancient warfare. Uh, what we're going to do is go back to first principle and look at who can attack whom and the burning issue of flanks as uh, well as revisiting ambushes which is an area where I'm getting a few questions and obviously ties in nicely with close combat. Um, much of what I'm going to say on that subject will be a repeat of what was covered in the episode on deployment but clearly uh, this bears repetition as we're still getting some questions. So let's jump straight in and look at the very foundations of close combat which is who can attack and who can't. Um, we'll take a look at warriors here and then move on to skirmishers and cavalry afterwards. Okay, so here we have a single group. Uh, any unit, be it a single group or mob or formation, has a frontal zone and a flank and rear zone. This simple line across the front of the unit extending out will tell us where an attacker will make contact with them. If the attacker begins their move in the frontal zone, then the attack will be made on the front of the target unit. If the attacker begins their move in the flank or rear zone, then the attack will be made on the flank or the rear of the target. This is true whether the attacker is already on the table or whether they are ambushing. Looking at this image, we can see that two of these ambush points are in the flank and rear zone, and then these two are in the frontal zone. One very specific question which is coming up is whether a mob can deploy from an ambush point in the frontal zone onto the flank of their opponent and then fanatics can ambush out to achieve a flank attack, as we can see here. Now the first part of that is perfectly legitimate. You can deploy into the enemy's flank or rear zone, there's nothing stopping you doing that, but you cannot then immediately launch fanatics out as they are quite clearly not tracing a straight line from the ambush point. So the answer is no. Uh, their attack must be from the zone where they began the move. There are no ifs and buts on it. I can see why people would want to do it, but it's actually not allowed. Um, so to summarise, if you're attacking from the front, you hit the enemy in the front. If you're attacking from the flank or rear, you hit the enemy in the flank or rear. It's that simple. OK, let's look at how attacks are made. Uh, with a single group attacking, this is very simple. As long as they can move into contact, uh, uh, and they've got enough movement to do so, they'll hit the enemy in either the front zone or the flank or rear zone. As we've seen, that depends where they began their movement. So here we can see a barbarian mob that will clearly make contact with the front of the Roman body. It's a bit of a, a, a sharp angle, but uh, as a single group they can do it. Formations or mobs attacking are slightly different as we need to consider the attacker's arc of engagement. Now that's a 90 degree arc emanating from each attacking group, 45 degrees to either side. Here we can see two groups in line formation and their arcs of engagement. These overlap, so what we've done is the group on the left uh, has got their arc shown in red and the one on the right in blue. To be able to attack an enemy whilst in formation or mob, the target unit must be in the attacker's arc of engagement before the attacker makes any movement. It's important to remember that each group within the formation has its own, or mob of course, has its own arc of engagement and we use that to determine if it can make contact with the enemy. Now in this example we can see that the two barbarian groups want to attack the Roman line. When we check their arc of engagement, we, uh, we've simply shown the left-hand side of that for both groups here, we can see that the group on the left can make contact with the line because part of it can make contact with the front of the target unit, but the group on the right cannot do so. What we can see by drawing these two simple lines, one across the front of the target unit and the other being the 90 degree of arc of engagement for the attacking group, it tells us exactly who can do what. There are no exceptions, no special rules, that's it. So always bear those two 
uh, lines in mind, the straight line across the front of the unit and that 90 degree arc coming out of the attacker. But look, looking at this, the example we've just looked at further, the group on the right that can't make contact won't stand there doing nothing. We have a system of supporting groups that means that whilst the group on the right can't make contact with the enemy, it can move up to provide support. Let's take a quick look at supports. So here we have uh, one Roman group being rather ganged up on by uh, four barbarian groups. Um, uh, we can see the group in the middle is uh, fighting the Romans and with it there are three other groups that are providing support. Um, an unengaged group on the flank of the attacker or immediately to its rear can support adding three d6 to combat dice providing they're over 50% strength. So that's a possible nine dice added to combat if you hit your opponent in such an absurdly theoretical uh, fashion. Uh, in our example um, that we looked at a moment ago, the group on the right uh, would not be able to move into con contact, but it can still exert an influence on the fight. But that's not the whole picture. Uh, there is a more risky option for Roman formations or barbarian mob. If the player wishes, and if they've got sufficient command initiatives, they can elect to break out of the formation or mob structure and have the groups attack individually. If you recall what we were saying uh, earlier was that a mob moving on its own has got no arc of engagement. That was how that unit could move right across at a sharp angle to make its attack on the, the Roman group. Um, how it attacks is simply governed by the target's frontal zone. So by attacking with these as individual groups, we can allow them potentially to make contact in a more advantageous way. Now that's going to require the leader to activate each group individually, and each group will move, um, will roll for its movement individually, and that makes it rather risky. If the groups are stepping out, they will have to do so individually, so it's going to cost double what it would have cost to get a a mob or a formation to step out. So it's costly in all respects and there's a huge risk that one group will make contact and the other one will simply lag behind and won't. But that's a choice we've got to make. So what I will say is, and maybe this is today's top tactical tip, for a barbarian mob packed with loads of fervour, this is much less risky than a Roman formation which is entirely reliant on its dice roll uh, to get them into uh, contact. Now this makes barbarians a bit more aggressive and a bit more dangerous and sh should certainly serve as a warning to the Romans that they uh, should expect the unexpected. So our attack goes in, contact's made, now we fight the close combat. The important thing to do here is to break the fight down into the lowest possible component parts, but they have to be whole groups. Um, here we see that's simple because we've got two groups in contact with two groups supporting, so that breaks down in two halves. Um, it is possible to get lots of configurations, but the rule is to break it down so that the smallest unit involved in each calculation is a group. So if we have two groups against one, that would still be just one combat because two versus uh, one, the one group cannot be broken down into half a group. Whereas if we had two versus two, that would be two combat combats and three versus two likewise would be two combats. Now each combat is fought in two rounds when it occurs, but the absolute key to remember is that this is simultaneous and that the results of each round of combat can affect the next. So for example, if these barbarians are obliged to fall back after the first round of combat, the Romans will benefit, uh, on the, on the um, left of this picture, will benefit from a supporting group to the flank on the next round. So we fight the first rounds, all of the first rounds, apply the results and then fight the second rounds. Now the close combat system is simple and I don't intend to dwell on it here in much detail. We'll be filming some battles where we'll be able to walk through that in more detail. But in a nutshell, you check the table for your basic number of dice, which will depend on your group. So for warriors typically that's going to be 8, uh, for elite warriors 10. Um, and then you check a table for anything uh, 
advantages such as supports or a leader's fighting or fervour of shock or any tactical advantage that you have. It's a simple process of just checking through the table to determine the total number of combat dice to be rolled. The only variation to this process is for Roman order, whether they're in close order and open order, and some situations where you're manning defences, which frankly are so arcane that I'm not going to discuss them in the general rules overview. That would be better done in um, uh, an example game. Order is very important for the simple reason that when a Roman group or formation is in close order, it must allocate between a third and a half of the total number of combat dice that it uh, has to defence dice. It's the player's choice, so if you have 15 combat dice, it can be anywhere between 5 and 7, 5, 6 or 7, that may be allocated as defence dice. But these have an enhanced chance of removing shock and potential kills caused by the barbarian attack, and it's a very effective means of defence. I'm not going to give a tactical tip here, because how you use tactical order is actually, I think, part of the fun of learning as a Roman player, uh, how to best fight with your uh, legionaries and auxilia, but suffice to say it is worth looking at. So we roll our dice for both sides and we work out the results. If both sides suffer one kill more than the enemy or the same number of kills in that round, then the fight continues to a second round. However, if the shock on any group reaches the point where it exceeds the number of figures in the group, then they're going to be withdrawing due to excess shock. If a group suffers two or more kills than the enemy, then they will withdraw uh, one inch for every point of shock, not just the excess ones. Now that's for warriors. Uh, some other troops will be um, skirmishers if they get caught, uh, or cavalry will be withdrawing two inches for every point of shock. Romans can follow up two inches if they choose to do so, so they may choose not to. Barbarians must, must follow up two inches, or one inch for each point of fervour they have, if that's greater than two. So if a group has five points of fervour, they'll follow up five inches. If they've got no points of fervour, they will still automatically follow up two inches. Don't forget, where one side is winning in a close combat, to mark that with a token, as it's the easiest benefit in close combat to forget when applying uh, the table to see uh, how many dice you have. Um, I use a, one of the close, combat, uh, close order markers for the Romans, but on the reverse side I painted it bright yellow, which I placed with the side that is winning in close combat, just because it's eye-catching and uh, reminds me to apply that. So, Two rounds of combat are fought whenever the fight occurs. Um, when it's first initiated, close combat lasts two rounds unless either side withdraw. The fight then continues when the most senior leader on either side in the fight is activated or when another group, mob or formation joins in the combat. Combat resumes automatically with no cost in command initiative, so when the leaders are there, they can use their command initiatives to do other things. Certainly rallying shock is going to be an important one, but potentially using um, drill or barbarian orders as well, which we'll look at in more detail in our next programme. So, how do you win in combat? It's highly unlikely to the point of almost being impossible, but not quite, that a group will be wiped out. What's far more likely is that a combination of losses and shock will see groups retire from the action or even break and run. As mentioned, groups with excess shock uh, will withdraw one inch per point of excess shock if they're uh, warriors. Skirmishers, inferior warriors, mounted warriors, warriors in chariots, they will all withdraw two inches for a point of excess shock. How do we define excess shock? Well, if you've got five figures and you've got six points of shock you've got one excess shock if you've got four figures and seven points of shock you've got three excess shock um, they uh, troops withdrawing due to excess shock will end their movement facing the enemy they're not broken they're simply withdrawing maybe having a break in uh, contact to try and steady their nerves or recover a bit of that shock 
groups that are withdrawing will normally move directly away from the enemy. If they've been hit on the flank and the rear, they'll move away at a 45 degree angle. And if there are any enemy blocking their passage, then they will keep four inches away from them, changing their path to keep away from uh, the blocking unit. If a group reaches a point where shock is double the number of figures, it breaks. The broken group routes 2d6 plus 6 inches directly away from the enemy, ending their move facing away from the enemy. Again, if their path is blocked, they move to avoid an enemy keeping 4 inches away. Um, if retiring or routing troops can't avoid contact, a retiring group will fight close combat immediately, counted as being contacted in the flank or rear. Quite frankly, with a routing group, you might as well just take them off because the chances of them having any dice to fight with is pretty, uh, pretty much zero. Okay, so that's how warriors operate in close combat. Uh, cavalry are a bit different in that both skirmishers and mounted warriors have got limited staying power in close combat. Skirmish cavalry withdraw, will withdraw at the end of any round of close combat where they have got any shock, falling back two inches for each point of shock. Mounted warriors will fight for two rounds, but must retire if they have any shock at the end of that, unless they defeated the enemy by a net two kills or more, in which case they will attempt to follow up and fight one more round of uh, combat, after which they will... Um, withdraw with any shock that they have. Let's talk about skirmishers, um, but when we do we need to put that into context and talk about evading as well, because skirmishers will, are not going to stand up to uh, a charge, in fact they'll simply, skirmish troops will, on foot will simply run away if an enemy comes near them. If the enemy attempt to make contact, they will automatically evade either onto friendly warriors who are acting as a rallying point, which is something we're going to co cover in a, a, another programme, or by running 2d6 inches away from them, facing away from the attacker. Some other troops can choose whether to evade or not. Now that includes warriors with flexible drill who are skirmishing, uh, includes chariot mounted warriors and skirmish cavalry. Mounted warriors can evade but only when they're attacked from the flank or the rear. They are the nobles um, of, uh, of their people, and uh, if somebody attacks them in the front, they're going to be quite happy to get stuck in. Uh, that's just simply the way they think. Uh, but if somebody's cheating in their mind by attacking them unfairly in the flank or rear, they have got uh, every reason to uh, evade, um, because uh, uh, that, that suits their ethos in terms of people making a cowardly attack on them. Um, chariots and mounted troops are uh, evade with 3d6 if in open ground. Obviously some of these distances are going to be reduced if the terrain is particularly bad. All evading groups can elect to use signa cards to add an additional 1d6 of movement for each card played. Now it's important here to get the sequence of things right when it's evading. Um, when the attacker um, says uh, they're going to attack, they must tell the unit that has potential to evade to allow it to choose to uh, evade. If they, uh, some units will have to evade, such as light skirmish troops, but auxiliar may, and other troops may choose not to. But So they have to say, look, we're going to charge you, what do you want to do, are you going to evade? The evader then decides whether to add whether they're going to do that or not, and if they are, whether they're going to add any Signa cards, and only then do they roll all of their dice for movement. At that point, the attacker may then make their move, but first they have to decide whether they're going to step out with any Signa cards they have available to add any dice to that movement. For both sides, you can't roll for movement and then decide, oh, well, I haven't moved far enough, I'm going to play some Signa cards and carry on. Uh, it's got to be declared before uh, and the signal cards played before you roll the dice. If an evading group fails to move far enough and is contacted, well, close combat will ensue, with the evading group counted as being hit in the rear. Okay, well, that's all for this program. We do have the issue of rallying points to cover, but I'd like to do that in another program in this series. As always, if you've got any questions or comments, please do put them below. But please try and keep them to be one specifically related to the subject, which in this programme is close combat. In our next programme, we're going to be looking at leadership, 
drill and barbarian commands because I think we've got the basic building blocks in place now um, and what we can start doing is layering on a bit more of that detail and command and control is definitely in that. So I hope you'll join me for that and we'll see you then.